Good morning once again. Welcome to our time together here at St. Olive's. And just a reminder about our big carol service on the 11th of December with Alex Keane, which is always a wonderful occasion as we sing the traditional uh, Christmas carols and um, listen to some of the choirs and hear some of the explanations about how some of these uh, carols were written and, of course, look at some of the familiar Christmas readings, which is what we're going to be starting to do for the next few weeks this morning as well. Uh, please do continue to pray for... Um, uh, for June Boshoff, who's recovering from a stroke, uh, for John uh, uh, Parker, who, who sadly had to have part of his leg amputated, uh, and also for Margie Griffiths, who's been in hospital this week at, uh, at the Seine. Uh, and so we come today to look at the beginning, which is a little explanation in Galatians chapter 4, where the Apostle Paul explains to us what Christmas is all about, what was happening on that first Christmas night. And so we read the words in Galatians 4, and I'm just going to look at two verses this morning. Verses 4 and 5. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption uh, to sonship. Now, we Christians have believed for 2,000 years that the Accounts that we read in the Gospels are accurate, they're historically correct, and so that what we are reading and believing is not fake news, but it is fact. These are factual things that actually happened in time and space and in history according to God's plan. As we consider these verses this morning, the first thing that happened is that the fullness of time had come. And what does Paul mean when he says the fullness of time had come? Well, first of all, it means that it was exactly the right time, politically, socially, for God's plan of salvation uh, to begin. And so the Roman Empire held sway over the world at that time. It was known as the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. The Roman military machine had subdued the rest of the world. But they'd also done more than that, the Romans. They'd also built roads all over the empire for their armies to travel and to maintain that peace. And therefore, travel was also easier for civilians. And we see something of this when we get to the book of Acts, when we see Paul and the other missionaries uh, taking the gospel to all the main cities throughout the empire and doing so relatively easy because the infrastructure was in place at that time, whereas that would not have been the case 50 or 100 or 200 years earlier. Also at that time, Greek had become the common language, very much like English is the common language today. We English speakers don't realize the huge advantage we have in speaking English. It's the, the language that is used most in the world's communication, be it business or politics or whatever the case might be. It puts us at a great advantage. And the language that was similar to English in those days was Greek. And that's why the New Testament, of course, is written in Greek, because it meant that it could be read by a large number of people throughout the then known world um, at that time. And then the other thing that was happening at that particular point is that the old religions and philosophies, the old Roman and Greek gods, you know, the ones you learnt about if you did Latin at school, like I did, like Zeus and Poseidon and all the rest of them, well, they were actually losing their appeal. So there was a vacuum, there was a spiritual vacuum. And it was into that spiritual vacuum at the time that Jesus was born. All of this is a reminder that everything is under God's sovereign control. And the Bible teaches us that there's a beginning, there will be an end, and that Jesus coming again will signal the end of history. So here we are now. Uh, as we follow the church calendar, we're at the beginning of the Advent season. It reminds us of the second coming, about the second coming. It reminds us about the things that really matter in life, things like death and judgment and heaven uh, and hell, that we need to think about these things because they have a bearing upon where we will spend eternity. They have a bearing upon our lives now and the decisions that we need to make now, the most important of which is that we need to follow, accept, believe and follow Jesus. But Paul goes on and he says that a second thing that happened was absolutely fundamental. It says, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, so it was a real birth, born under the law. So he was born, was Jesus, as a real 
Jew. And this was according to God's plan. It had been foretold 800 years earlier by the prophet Isaiah when he said, To us a child is born, to us a son is given. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And those words could now be said of a Jewish baby born in a manger in Bethlehem. It's quite an amazing thought. Our great eternal God, the creator of this amazing universe in which we live, revealed himself as an utterly weak human baby. Jesus, who is fully God, but fully man, as we sing in the well-known carol, God of God, light of light, Lo, he abhors not the virgin's womb, very God, begotten, not created. Now, it took the apostles three years, and his death, his resurrection, leaving behind the empty tomb, their meeting the risen Jesus on a number of occasions, uh, known as the post-resurrection uh, appearances. It took all of that to make them realize that this Jesus is God come in human flesh. To see the reality of God as the Trinity, one God in three, in three persons. So the great thing that happened that night, that first Christmas night, was that God sent forth his son. And then thirdly, what happened that night is that a baby was to be born and he was to be the savior of the world. Unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Paul puts it like this in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 5. God becoming man was to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. So Paul is saying here that salvation involves two things. It involves redemption from sin and it involves adoption by God. Why is it that at this time of the year, and we all belong to these crime groups to tell us where the latest, uh, un unfortunately and sadly, the latest incident of crime has occurred in our neighborhood. Why is it that they're all warning us now to be extra alert as though we can be extra alert and watchful? Because there's a spike in crime at Christmas time. Why is it that at this Christmas, this particular Christmas that we're going into 2022, following on from the ravages of the Ukraine war and the after effects of all the uh, lockdowns, uh, that we live with higher inflation that we've had in over 10 years. And the result being that this will be, for ordinary people like ourselves, the most expensive Christmas that we would have ever had in our lifetimes. And I'm talking here about the basic things that we are able to enjoy, be it the turkey, be it the gammon, be it the Christmas crackers, be it the Christmas presents that we buy for our loved ones and family. That is going to cost us more this Christmas, far more in fact, than would have been the case 12 months ago. Why is it that we, ha that we have all of this? Now, of course, there are social and material causes, and yes, there are obvious uh, explanations, such as the ongoing war. And yes, politicians can apply some sticking plaster solutions and help in small ways. But what is the fundamental reason? What is the fundamental cause of the problems in our world today? And Jesus gives it to us in Mark chapter 7 and verse 21. He says, From within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and of course, foolishness. And so we are dealing with a spiritual heart disease that the Bible calls sin, which is basically about disobeying God, going our own way. And that needs a spiritual remedy. Otherwise, it leads to death. And the Bible teaches that from Genesis chapter 3 and the fall of our original ancestors, that we are all sinners, that we are born into sin, that that is our natural gravitation. And that is why Paul says that Jesus Christ came that first Christmas to redeem us from being spiritual slaves to sin so that we can experience redemption and we might receive adoption as sons. Just like in the Roman world of his day, a freed slave could be adopted into a family and treated as a son and an heir. And so Jesus Christ redeemed us by dying on the cross to bear the punishment that otherwise we deserve for our sins. And so then we can be adopted 
into God's family. We are not naturally born into God's family. We are not naturally sons and daughters of God. But we may be adopted into his family. And then we can start living as God intended. And then we can help to make what we all desire and want uh, and call a good society. And so to read the prologue in John's Gospel, He that is Jesus came to his own, his own did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed on his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And so who this Christmas needs to receive Jesus now as the risen Lord and Savior and trust him for life and eternity to become a true child of God, our Heavenly Father, and it means that we can bring all our needs and problems to him. Or as Peter put it in 1 Peter chapter 5, lay all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And if you have real needs, well, you can pray. God wants to meet those needs, not necessarily as we want or expect them to be met, but for our own real good. Jesus himself says on the Sermon on the Mount, ask and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. And so, as we start the run-up to Christmas, let's reflect on these things. Let's thank God for sending Jesus into the world, and let's come now to him in prayer as we close our service today. And so, Lord, we thank you for this time. We've been able to just begin here at the beginning of the Advent season, reflect on Jesus, reflect on why he came. We are so thankful that this was part of your great plan of salvation, our Heavenly Father. And so we praise and worship you, and we praise and worship and adore our Lord Jesus, who has made all of this possible. And we ask and thank you in his name. Amen.